probably most importantly is there's going to be a fantastic panel tomorrow. The first panel of uh, of all of our panels is the HCE panel. And there's just a great group of speakers and it's going to be a really interesting conversation. So everybody, please come to that tomorrow morning. Um, and I hope that they'll share their resources because they've been working really hard this semester to put up a set of HCE public resources like we have for the other materials. And um, there's a whole website online, so um, hopefully they'll share that. And without that, take it away, you guys. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Margot Vaneglipson, and um, I work with Ari Edmondson and also with Katherine Carson in the HCE program at Berkeley. And we really welcome you to this uh, one hour conversation together. Um, we're the purpose of this today is to uh, prove, uh, you know, propose a time to uh, speak with you about shared interests in teaching about the human context and ethics as part of data science education. And it's an opportunity. We see this as an opportunity to talk to be together about how you know, our teaching at Berkeley works uh, and to try to answer questions about our program. You know, what's working? What are our challenges? Um, as well as to have a conversation with you, everybody who is here, who we cannot see, but who we know are uh, there listening, um, about what you're building and how what you're building could be, how we can do things in partnership where we might be able to support you with the kinds of experiences and resources that, that we've assembled through really a, a, over a year of working on this. Um, you might have been able to see our videos from day one about an introduction to the human context and ethics program at Berkeley and our approach, and also specifically about one of our courses, Data 104. So I'd like to invite um, Ari and Catherine to introduce themselves and then we can um, get to know each other and get to your question. Hi, uh, my name's Ari Edmondson. Can you uh, everyone hear me all right? Eric's not coming through, great. Um, so I'm uh, uh, with Margo, uh, a coordinator in the uh, Human Context and Ethics Program and the Data Science Education Program at Berkeley and also a lecturer uh, in the Department of History, uh, which is where I got my PhD uh, last year, um, specifically in intellectual history, um, 20th century intellectual history. And I've been involved in the Human Context and Ethics program uh, since the first time the course was offered as initially designed uh, by Margo and Catherine. And I started out as a graduate student instructor, uh, helping to, to teach the course by leading discussion sections and now giving uh, the, you know, half the lectures uh, to our large course that Margo's video details um, and helping design curriculum and run student teams. Uh, I'll leave it at that and pass it off to Catherine. Okay, hey, I'm having a little bit of video trouble. Can can you guys hear and see me? Yeah. Okay, sure. this is good. Okay, um, I'm Catherine Carson. I'm the Associate Dean for Strategy and Planning in our new Division of Computing Data Science and Society. And my faculty appointment is in the History Department, which I feel like I can share in this setting. I don't always in the data science world that is, you know, principally seen as technical STEM. Um, I come from the perspective of history, science, technology studies, a little bit of continental philosophy, and have been helping shape the data science program here since, oh, at least 2014, when I co-chaired the design team for the curriculum. So it's been really just a thrill to see how human context and ethics can be taken as an integral part of a data science program, both our major and our minor require it and to work with Margot and Ari on crafting both the Data 104 course, which is part of the backbone that Margot's video has described, and some of the other interesting interventions that Ari's video starts to open the door to as well. So with that, I hand it back to Margot in the hope that she might say a little bit more about herself too. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so my background is also in the social sciences. I um, a, a, a combination of different social sciences that all look together at the role of technology in the human condition. So history, 
philosophy and and questions of uh, and science, technology, and society, specifically questions around uh, citizenship and democracy. Uh, so we so the way that we thought that we might um, we might proceed in this hour together is to really uh, always you know if we were in a real world real world setting <laughs> real physical setting we really want to know who you are and and what brings you to this panel what kinds of questions or not even questions but areas of interest uh, or thought that you're bringing in um, and we have this uh, alternative way to kind of get get a little bit at that through through a Google Doc, of course, <laughs> a shared Google Doc, which you'll find a link to it in the in the Teams, uh, in the Teams section of of the interface uh, in the channel conversation there. And if you could put at, please, as you've been doing, add your name there. And also, I see that the who's here piece has become a little bit filled out, but the questions that you might have for us today, what topics you'd like to discuss with us today, are not yet uh, there. So we invite you to, in the next, you know, in the next few minutes, you know, put something there that's on your mind that we could speak together about, because we'd like this to be about you. We also put there, as you can see, so while while I'm talking, please feel free to populate that uh, piece of this of the spreadsheet or uh, also you can post things in the chat here and we'll try to pay attention to to the multiple interfaces that we've got going on. Um, and we'll if you have a question, we'd love to for you to ask it um, through your own voice. So that would be our preference. Um, so if you, you do, please, please just send a note in chat and uh, we'll call on you. Um, OK, so while you're collecting your thoughts about that, there are also some things, some, some questions about teaching human context and ethics as part of data science education that's really on our mind right now. So these are things that um, preoccupy us and are going to be part of our, our work this summer and, and in the coming year. And perhaps these will be interest to you so we could just if there are no questions at the moment, we can begin with that and then um, see what arises. OK, all right, so then it will be a, a three way conversation with Catherine and Ari and myself um, on the topic of. Online online HC, so um, we just recently decided that this large 400 person course uh, data 104 about which you can watch a video. Uh, from day one of this workshop is going to be fully online in the fall. And this is a really big change. Of course, it's a change for any course. Um, and I think all instructors across the board and all universities are feeling the transformation. But there's something particular about teaching HCE that I think is worthwhile talking about um, because of its relationship to the individual student, to the classroom community, uh, to listening to one another and responding to one another. And it's not that online spaces cannot be an appropriate vehicle for these this type of embodied personal learning, uh, but it's clearly is not yet, I think, uh, we're not yet explicit with ourselves and with one another about what, what it is that HCE learning requires in this um, beyond the content in the in the affective dimension and the risk taking dimension and how to get that through an online fully online experience so it's something on our minds um I, so just throwing up this topic and i uh, want to see if and if i read catherine if it inspires any thoughts and for you yeah i mean one of the things i just want to re really reinforce that margo said that's been um i think a really core part of what's made HCE feel really successful and vital to me um, at Berkeley, especially as somebody who started um, as a GSI and therefore getting the real opportunity to interact with students at a, at a different level than I now get to lecturing to 400 plus students at a time um, where that distance, you know, even when you're in the room is, is already really palpable. Um, was I got the comments from a lot of students in a couple of years that I that I, I taught this course, um, especially the, the data science majors, that having uh, office hours like with a graduate student instructor who could show them a human face, sort of putting really the human in the human context, was something that they didn't often get. Um, uh, whether it was because it wasn't available or they didn't feel comfortable. Um, so the 
I guess part of what I'm saying is there's really a kind of essential to HCE at Berkeley, a dimension that's not even just strictly about pedagogy, uh, so much as environment, um, community building, giving students a kind of sense of like office hours as a space where they can come and share their personal life stories, connect how discussions uh, in class um, relate to personal issues that they're going through and find that they have a kind of a sympathetic ear. And so for me, a big piece of HD has been trying to build those spaces of like of, of human comfort. And one of the real yeah, challenges, and I think we haven't figured out exactly how to do that best, because that, that comfort is what allows for things like risk taking that Margot mentioned, how to actually translate that into uh, an online environment for the fall. Um, and given that that's not something that I ever got an opportunity to do when I was a GSI, is something that we're certainly thinking a lot about right now, um, uh, because you know, one one thing that we our, our GSIs told us that uh, sections for the second half of the semester were actually quite successful, but that was already pre kind of presupposing that they had had the kind of half of the semester to get to know students in person to have kind of in person office hours to grant you know gather that kind of familiarity. So, um, recognizing how much that kind of those extracurricular factors are really essential. Um, and if I'd love also to hear if other people have thoughts about that. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, GSI, when I said that, is graduate student instructor or TA. So one of the things that is essentially behind this is when you teach about questions of ethics or ethos or human context, it really does open up questions of personal value choices, which then, you know, whether you intend it or not, spills over into a more personal relationship in many cases for the students with their HCE instructors compared to what they may be used to having. And that's a feature of the course that whether or not it's online has been something that we've all sort of accommodated ourselves to and come to see as a strength of the course, but we hadn't necessarily understood it was a design feature of the course. We would we sort of knew we were gonna be prodding them to think about their personal commitments and their ethos, but to realize that there is a part of pedagogy that's about human care in these areas and to integrate that into our teaching started to dawn on us even before we went online. And that may be something that um, other folks on this office hours call may have experience with, especially if you're teaching in this area, whether or not you call it ethics or human context, it's, it's the kind of personal encounter with the students as persons that seems to be opened up by talking about ethics in a higher educational setting. And I might mention one kind of pedagogical feature that was kind of put in place from the beginning that's proved somewhat effective in doing this, even though um, students have had mixed responses to it, is actually having students write a number of personal reflections, especially early in the semester and later, to try to directly connect their life's experience um, to the concepts that we're bringing up in class. Uh, uh, as Catherine was already, you know, kind of pushing at, you know, we're not telling students what their values should be or what kind of human context and ethics values are. Uh, someone just trying to help provide them a vocabulary, uh, a kind of sensitivity to certain features of the world, and also to provide an opportunity to come to, to, to reflect on their own ethical intuitions, which are often robust, but not always fully articulated, don't always have a vocabulary. And so giving students that space to write about them. And we've had students feel like sometimes it's busy work. Um, and when we're when kind of writing about the class, but a number of students have directly come again to me in office hours to talk about something they wrote about, uh, how it links to conversations in section, how it really motivated the, um, them to get more interested, it, it, how it um, kind of helped invest their their passion for the their vignette, which is our um, sort of capstone project for the course, a, a, a short thousand word essay that each student has to write. That's either kind of a op ed or uh, public service announcement, policy paper, there's several different types that address a really specific um, 
issue relating to, to the human context and ethics of data. And we, we've been really trying to encourage students to connect um, those reflections, their personal experiences to doing that kind of work so that they can see their own personal links to um, the extent of their, you know, their expertise as, as data scientists in, in the making. And that's been a particularly powerful place where I've seen a lot of, a lot of, a lot of growth take place in this world. So there's an interesting um, f question in, in the Google Doc about from um, someone who says that they are a finance professor and would like to know how we might merge data science and finance and specifically asking about this, the, the, you know, pointing out that uh, students might be introduced to personal finance and data science concepts early on and that the process of getting introduction to this is um, allows them to reflect upon you know, not just learn about finance uh, and personal finance and responsibility in that regard, but also connect them to and for a way to bring in uh, broader questions about uh, economics in, in 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 the world and the range of the range of social and human issues that that involves. Um, so I think, in a way, uh, the person uh, is you. You are the <laughs> you're the person who's writing this question as actually kind of answering, um, providing the answer um, themselves and I'd love to have their, them be able to express their perspective. Um, but the, the, it's, it's really wonderful in the way that you propose this might open up this kind of human individual connection um, to the course material through learning of something technical. And uh, I think that goes thinking about how to to make that connection um, is some it, it perhaps would work really actually that kind of connection would work well in an online um, in an online through online activities um, perhaps I should I'm not I'm not saying anything particularly clear uh, so maybe it would be better if, if the person who wrote this question asked if they'd like to say something about it Okay, I see. So you're saying you're yeah, you're not answering. I guess what is what's interesting to me about your your question is perhaps because I cannot answer I cannot answer what tools might feel work best within Jupiter within Jupiter Hub. That's an almost a uh, you know it's a, probably a question for another person in in the data science education program who really knows the tools there and how to connect the technical learning about finance with. Um, with data science, but what's where I feel like you are providing really nice insights into the human context and ethic dimension of your of the exercise that you're in a sense acquiring about is uh, is about the is is the possibility of linking the individual person's students' learning experience with their broader awareness of the social world in which they sit through this kind of exercise. How it will look particularly is a question, but. The, the fact that it lends itself to thinking about the human context and ethics, uh, to socioeconomic status, to the economy, um, and the place of different people in it, seems to be a really very provocative and and and, and useful um, technique. Right. What I, what I just found, I guess, interesting, uh, just thinking about it, was the. I guess socioeconomic with how Eric has changed shirts almost every different session. And <laughs> now I'm not supposed to tell that. Oh, and you know, it's like, you know, we're, we're going through a pandemic and quarantine, and there's so many clothing stores that are closing, and, and people are struggling to go out of business. But you know, there's a financial component to that. And, you know, everybody doesn't have, you know, a, a, a new shirt. Everybody doesn't have a, a different widget, you know. It's like um, um, I was talking to my brother the other day, and he was talking about, oh, I was happy he didn't have a, a second car. Um, but he was thinking about buying a second car. But at this point, it's, it's, it's not worth it. And I was, I'm on the opposite end because I was like, oh, you know, where I was in a one car household and a two car household now. And it's like, oh, I don't need the second car <laughs> with the payments. And, um, you know, so 
I, I just think there's uh, so many lessons to be learned, like right now in this environment. And, uh, you know, data science is such a, a rich tool to use um, to do that, um, to tell stories, um, to show things visually, um, and things like that. So, you know, um, just trying to understand better and get kind of your, your viewpoints and thoughts on it, if that makes sense. Well, one way we might approach this, if it's if it's useful to run a little bit further. Um, I mean, there are sort of two ways in to the course material. One is through personal experience, and we do a lot of that in section. And the other is with introducing students to concepts of tools like social class or power differentials and being really explicit about um, inviting them to engage with those as both like personal experiences and social structures that shape all data science activity. And so a conversation with personal finance could either go to individual students observations about say their own knowledge of where their expenditures are going or it could go to like looking at data on spending meets social class or geography meets spending or where are there um, say grocery deserts when you map business locations onto um, on, onto geospatial maps. So there are all sorts of ways to sort of get at questions that are related to the values that show up implicitly or explicitly in data science practice, whether you want to do it through their personal experiences or whether you want to bring in these larger social concepts and structures. And I think it may be a matter of instructor choice also, which direction feels most appropriate to go. Um, because socioeconomic status is both like personally experienced, those students may not always have the language to talk about it. And like a fundamental structure of our social world race, class, gender, disability status, sexuality, all of those things that social scientists and humanists take as like fundamental lenses on the social world show up in every part of data science practice as well. It's probably pretty abstract. <laughs> Maybe there are simpler, simpler ways into this or other questions to take up. No, that's good. Um, I, I think I was thinking about both of them. Um, my question, I mentioned the uh, personal finance course and an investment finance course. So kind of taking a more of a, a macro approach with the investment finance course um, versus personal finance. So I think both. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just say, Patrick, uh, my closet isn't really that deep. I'm just like happened to be running a conference out of my bedroom and I'm next to my dresser. And so uh, <laughs> what I what I do want to say, though, is I'm trying to make the conversation interactive and catch your eye with what little I have. So I'm trying to like, you know, get, get some way that like we're, we're interacting here and, and somehow it got you. Um, so we have, I see there's a hand, uh, there are some ni really nice questions also in the doc. Um, I saw this hand earlier on from Richard Weiss. Would you like to? Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so I want to, yeah, I teach ethics, actually computer ethics, and, um, and I'm always looking for interesting cases that engage students. And so, and I have, so I have multiple things to say or questions. One is what's what readings have you used, for example, that you feel engage students the most? What stands out in your mind is something that where students really uh, participated. And the second thing is, um, which I just realized because of, I guess, from the 
discussion with the last speaker um, that normally I approach um, I approach ethics in terms of you know we talk about privacy and security and things like that and um, and that's one of the ways in which you know I think data science especially comes up in a negative light okay this is a threat to our privacy um, but I just realized also that there are many positive ways. In particular, you're talking about um, the social context and um, you know economic factors and how people are impacted by the current pandemic and all and things like that. Do you have some thoughts about what are the positive ways that we could use data science to uh, to address those issues and talk about them with the students? get them to generate ideas. So I'm just going to jump in. There's a, a number of really excellent questions um, <laughs> that we could spend, I think, a long time parsing through. My initial reaction in parts to the last kind of thing about like focusing on negatives versus positives um, is something we actually, I think, explicitly try to disabuse ourselves of mostly or avoid framing it as like, here's how data science does something bad. Here's how it does something good a really central framing um, kind of structure of HCE and our course in particular is, um, is the idea of, of, of world making and kind of social constructivism more broadly. And so that's looking at how does the world evolving with and transforming with being co-produced along with data technologies and data sciences. And so we try to spend a lot of time getting our students to simply think about the world differently, to experience themselves and their expertise and their place in it as constructive exercises that do something. Um, and whether or not those things are good or bad um, is not a moot question by any means. We want people to sensitize themselves to the kinds of violences and injustices that take place and look at ways in which data can uh, both, for example, we have a lecture on data witnessing and our, um, where, where um, Margot talks, so I should let her talk about it a bit more, but talks a bit about ways in which data can be used to, uh, you know, witness, uh, by, you know, by the public to sort of bear witness to either in, injustices in the world and um, create means of sort of addressing them uh, by making certain things visible that hadn't yet been visible. So while we're always constantly attuned to, um, to you know, places where the public senses issues of, viol you know, of, of, of violence or a violation of certain mores or norms. You know, in the first instance, we do want to talk about making sense of the world that's being created in and through data science uh, before anything else. So um, as far as readings, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and, and see what, what Margot and Catherine have to say. Yeah, when thinking about your questions of readings, I think uh, rather than picking out individual readings, it's to suggest uh, types of readings that I think students particularly find interesting and are useful pedagogical tools. And this is one of these is historical kind of works that deal with history. So these actually might not be, you know, about, uh, there might not be directly about the present moment. There might not be even about data. They might be a broader about history, his kind of examples of technology working itself out in different social contexts in the past. So I'm thinking, for example, of um, Bauker and Starr's uh, book on classification, but also uh, particularly the, the chapter on apartheid and, and the use of, of categories, of the human practice of, of categorizing and, and, and its particular habit of how it worked itself out in a specific context of South Africa um, in relation to, 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 to race there. So that's very helpful for them to think about the present day in a way that they, they can understand issues in those historical moments in a way that's less, um, you know, at a distance. The history in part, in, the, in this case, gives them an ability to see things that are still with us today and are in a, with us in new and different ways, but kind of give them that distance on the issue so that they're, they can they can grapple with them um, more kind of comprehensively. Or uh, 
uh, Langdon Winner's piece on on the role of technology in the in, in, in kind of questions of power and infrastructures more generally, not at all about data, but about other types of technologies. And then they can begin to think about what's kind of what's similar and different to today. Kind of to address Ari's point of of how are how is our present with data have shaped and informed, transformed, rather than just being about you know costs and benefits or good and bad. And another set of readings that I think we uh, students really like and and also we aspire them to 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 look for it on their own is is to um, to look at primary sources or to make certain documents into primary sources. So, for instance, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, testimony in front of Congress, uh, we, we assign students to watch 20 minutes of that testimony of those many, many hours of testimony and then get them to to apply course and kind of concepts, topics to that as a primary source or to look at something like I you know Google Selfish Ledger, you know, something that came out a few years a few years ago of, of Google projecting, imagining what it what its technology can do um, for society. And using out of there because there's so much of this, if you will, you know, production of, of a primary source material about the world and, and data's place in it today, that getting students to take that um, Again, again, distanced uh, perspective of seeing it as something that's a product of individual people, a product of history, kind of allows them to uh, practice, um, practice kind of grappling, reflecting uh, on our present. Um, and just even though I, you know, we avoided kind of naming specific readings, just one thing to throw out there, in part because it sort of obliquely also touches on Lee Stott's question uh, about relations to industry um, is that we also do a number of readings that and, and have lectures specifically about the history of Silicon Valley, um, both kind of the political economic dimensions as well as the cultural dimensions. Um, and something I think a lot of students really enjoy are reading some really incredible sort of personal narratives, essays uh, about existing in Silicon Valley, working in the tech sphere. Um, and what that looks like. Um, so Anna Wiener's, uh, what was initially an N plus one essay called Uncanny Valley, it came out as a full book um, just this January, uh, is a really, um, I mean, it's a great piece about somebody coming from a non-tech background working uh, initially for a behavioral analytics firm. Um, and, and our students love that piece, I mean, especially the women because it, it highlights gender a lot. Um, that's something that also really brings them in and it makes some of this stuff feel vital and makes the idea of what are the sorts of things that you you know see uh, ex can expect to see when you enter industry. And that's something that at the end of the course, we try to get students to imagine how do you work for change in industry, create some scenarios where they imagine some ethical violation has taken place in their company and try to imagine, get them to really imagine themselves into a company structure and think about how are you, you know, what modes of action are available to you? What are the things that you can do? What kinds of power do you have um, at any, you know, at respective company? So that's only a very partial answer to Lee's question, but also this thing about readings that really connect to, to students, you know, ones with, you know, that are you know, data scientists through and through, as well as, you know, the humanities, social science uh, students in the class. I read what you're saying just now really connects well to another question in the doc which is uh, asking about how to engage equally, perhaps, um, you know, or in different ways, but at the same time, students from more technical training, uh, from computer science, that's math backgrounds, and students from social science, the humanities. Like what are, you know, how to bring this diversity of learners together? Uh, do you wanna share any of experiences that we've had with, with this? Oh, me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this has been in many ways one of our challenges, um, but in a different way, because we don't have the challenge of getting uh, data science students to take the course uh, because it, it fulfills a requirement uh, for the data science major. So the vast majority of students that take Data 104 are data science majors. Um, I don't remember what the most recent numbers are, but it's really the, 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 the vast majority of them, um, or, or at least in related disciplines. In some ways, we'd love to get more humanities and social scientists into the class um, so that there's kind of a more more you know sort of um, intellectual diversity um, but certainly it's 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 been a challenge um, a lot of that work really does we realize come down to gsis finding ways to 
to get those students to start where they are. I mean, you really, you figure out where they are, what's interesting to them in section, and you start to play to their strengths a little bit. So that doesn't help when you don't have them actually getting into your classes, which is an issue of institution building. It's an issue of yeah, advertising the class, uh, working with the STEM disciplines, uh, you know, with colleagues. Um, and that's something, you know, I think Catherine might be able to talk more about. Maybe that's something that can really will come up in the institutional transformation panel tomorrow um, in some way. Um, I'll keep thinking about that. Margo, do you have other immediate mm -hmm. thoughts about? I find that some students come into the class um, not, you know, maybe not being really motivated or uh, feeling like they're going to take it just because it's fantasize a requirement. And they actually, along the way, really become very engaged. And I think what would be interesting to to know for Ari, for, for you and I is, is that you know, at what point, and I'm sure it's it's individual, it's very personal, but at what, you know, are, are there any patterns and what, you know, what engages them? I think sometimes, um, students are really opened up by the ability to see themselves and to participate as a full person in the classroom. Um, we hear from students that um, to our to already to to our point about, um, you know, the specificity of teaching this material and what it provides students is, is that we encourage students to bring themselves in to reflect upon one of our assignments are reflection exercises, which ask them to and of connect their own experience to the things that we're talking about in the class. Um, and we hear from our students that that space is not usually given to them in, 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 other, in other courses that they, they have, especially focused on, on technical curriculum. So I think a lot of them open up through, once they allow themselves to, to, to be engaged. And some of that happens through explicitly being invited to speak about their perspectives or to identify their positions on issues in conversation with other peers uh, as led and, mod and moderated by the graduate students or through the assignments. So perhaps, you know, a way to, to facilitate this is really to build structural spaces into the course where you can have conversation. One thing that we found challenging uh, outside of our uh, teaching in Data 104, which, as Ari said, we have, in a sense, a somewhat captive audience there uh, because students are required to, to take the class for a data science major or a class like ours. Um, but, but in other, in, when we are introducing curriculum into uh, Data 100 or you know, uh, Stat 102, Data 102, or other primarily at the moment technical data science courses, we find it hard to introduce our, our pieces because in part, structurally, there isn't a discussion space set apart in that class. Uh, and, and so I think when I'm thinking about how to answer your question, I feel like um, it is precisely about in structured assignments, um, spaces, leaving space for conversations, that's a big piece of getting students who are not used to doing this kind of, of participation and exploration of their ideas in relation to topics um, to, to, to feel invested. I have, and we've I have, had the conversion experiences by students who, who realized something about themselves that was really valuable to them through the process of learning about these broader social questions. Yeah, I've, I have two more things to kind of add to that. Um, one has to do it because what part of the question was also about evaluation and one of the things that we notice is um and this is true in our interventions and technical courses as well as in data 104 is students really want like really unequivocal criteria for assessment and that's always a good thing in an educational space um but it's the the demands for sort of more specification come especially uh, are much greater than what i've taught sort of non stem students and so we've you know developing really specific rubrics is a huge piece of that really kind of being able to spell out for students what they need to learn one of the tricks though is we're also trying to to some degree disabuse students of the notion that what it, doing well in this class is simply means giving back the correct answer <laughs> regurgitate you know memorizing facts and regurgitating it and teaching them analytical tools and getting them to think creatively and that can certainly lead to some frustration where it can feel arbitrary sometimes you know why didn't i get a better grade, I kind of spit, spit this back to you. Um, but you know, you, it, 
we're used to sort of, and, and graduate student instructors that help teach this are used to, to measuring these things and setting expectations in a kind of, sometimes in somewhat more ad hoc way. So that's certainly a challenge and one that there's a certain amount of negotiating you always have to do. Another is that a lot of STEM students like building things. So having activities and discussion sections where students aren't just discussing, because a lot of a lot of those students are often a little, you know, there's a greater number that are hesitant to sort of share their voices um, kind of directly in front of a large group. So having simulations like structured exercises that aren't just about like giving answers, but like creating something. So, you know, I have like a thing on the whiteboard that I used to do involving creating new classification system in a real scenario. So like looking at building an online streaming music system from the ground up as if, you know, Spotify didn't exist and you were trying to build it and how to think about it. And then to bring in the tools uh, that they learned about when reading about classification into that exercise and then thinking about aspects of the real world. What are places in which, you know, racism and bias can enter in? What are the contexts? that you don't necessarily think about when you use these services. How do these streaming services change the music industry? Who are the winners and losers in those kinds of processes? Students get really excited about that. They see something that they're contributing to kind of being built up on the board. Um, and so even students who are a little hesitant about that kind of participation really um, have, have always seem to really get excited about that. And they get to talk about the music they listen to and the way they listen to music. And that's interesting too. <clears throat> There's a question in the doc um, about from Lee Stott, who says, how do you relate HC back to what the industry is doing with data science and AI ethics? Um, so that's a wonderful question. And I, I like it in part because I think something which we aim to do in the class is is to show students how uh, how everybody, you know, from academy to industry to broader public um, is grappling with questions of the human and ethics around our data technologies and to show them that they therefore are there aren't as Ari was just saying you no know, there are not um there are no right there are no there <laughs> there are no right answers there are some wrong answers but there are no right answers and that to to learn how to become part of a collective working out of these really difficult um you know, historically situated structural issues. Um, and so therefore to show them what uh, the data science and computing communities as part of academia and as part of industry are doing, the kinds of questions they're asking, the kinds of questions they're not asking. Why uh, are they framing ethics as, you know, particular types of concerns? Um, why does privacy or security or fairness come up so much what's included in those kinds of concerns and what questions about our present world are missing um, how would they include those missing people or of types of approaches so we are again to say that uh, yes you know we truly really try to bring them into this world of this is you are a participant uh, in the making of the technology and then the making of the social worlds, the human worlds that accompany them, um, which are inseparable from them. And therefore to grapple with their place, to see what others are doing, to model their work on what is working, to uh, innovate together with us and their peers in ways that you know the, the, the industry is not able to do or is not doing uh, or where, where they see to be uh, holes to fill. And we take time to show them, you know, and I think we're, that's, this is always a constantly evolving thing because industry's reaction is to kind of problems of ethics have, have shifted since we started teaching the course. Um, and so calls for ethics, calls for things like responsible AI have really accelerated uh, since 2018 because of some of the big public events that happened in the midst of our semesters and that we had to sort of pivot to teach to, uh, which is also something that makes it vital is, you know, shifting, kind of pivoting the course mid-semester to talk about Cambridge Analytica, like in the very first time the course was offered, or most recently, both grappling and coping with COVID while also contextualizing it and bringing it into the material. So constantly gathering what's happening like that day in the world, or especially if it's something on campus, um, such as when there were, um, you know, protests around a program in uh, EECS, the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Berkeley, uh, their program that, uh, that gave the corporate access program that Palantir, amongst others, used to provoke protests. 
bringing those conversations into the classroom um, about industry relations to the university and getting students to talk about it and giving them some context to also think about what is it, you know, what are the industry responses? Why does industry respond the way it does um, given its particular position in the world, its structural constraints? Why do they use this language rather than some other language? What are alternatives? Um, why are they choosing at this moment to, to frame things this way rather than some other way? Um, so that's also one of the ways we just get them thinking about about it, about about industry is by talking about it in real time. Let's see, yeah. there was um, a question about recording, which is really interesting. Um, not something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, um, but one that that we'll need to. I mean it. I think there's. Can you rephrase the question, Ari? Just so. Yes, yes. So there's a question, um, and I'll just I'll read it. That says, you know, part of the discussion about safe space. Uh, the question is, could we share our thoughts on sort of when to record uh, classes or lab discussions? Because we're encouraged to record them for students who need to attend asynchronously, uh, but when students are sharing personal stories, ideas, and descriptions or information, recordings change the correct characteristics of the space, and that's totally true. Um, and what we did so far. Uh, at least in the spring, was for our discussion sections, um, we basically made it, because they're, they're all mandatory, is we did not record the Zoom um, discussion sections uh, precisely for that kind of reason. And we also do other things, like students who want to like switch sections, kind of go back and forth between lots of them. That sort of changes, you know, you have people in there you're not familiar with that can kind of change the balance. So it's something we think a lot about. Um, but we gave students who had to participate asynchronously um, at least when we had to pivot in the middle of the semester, different kinds of assignments um, so that we would, you know, write up some kind of general notes or GSIs would write up some general notes about what the conversation was and students participating asynchronously would have an online sort of written conversation that would take place in a certain sort of window afterwards and respond to some of the same ideas that were raised um, in the recorded uh, conversation. Um, so uh, that, that would be one thing. The other would be also, I guess, closely um, if you really did want to record discussion sections um, in order to give asynchronous students sort of the ability to see more that's going on is, is I think just building in secure ways that students who are not part of that discussion section, even if they're in the same class, don't have access to the video um, so that people feel like what I'm saying may be getting recorded, but it's only going to be listened to only be accessed by by the students that I'm, I would be speaking with in front of um, under normal circumstances. But even then, I, I, I'd be really cautious about it. And I would really, it could be the kind of thing that you, for every uh, discussion section, you'd have students sort of, you have a conversation at the beginning of the semester about it, and every section could be different and you get students to buy in. I mean, when we pivoted in the middle of the semester, every GSI's sections did some things a little bit differently and they talked to their students about their comfort levels with various things and what, what forms of engagement they wanted to do at that moment. So if it's at all possible, yeah, take the first couple of weeks to, to gauge student comfort, um, knowing that students might consent when they're not really comfortable to it. So really, again, trying to give them the space to decline in a way that doesn't single them out uh, as being uncomfortable with it being recorded. And this is especially important in, when we're talking about surveillance in the data five world and the persistence of recordings past the point that you thought you had consented to them. It just makes it explicit what how it links into the themes of the course. Yeah, yeah. So it could be a great exactly teaching moments, build in time to to bring bring everything back to that. Could I pick up a conversation that I've actually been having with a colleague in the the doc right now, which is how do you get the social scientists and humanists into your university planning? And I, I gave both a soft focus answer and a sort of hard edged one. The soft focus is like find your friends and get them to recommend friends. It, it truly doesn't have to be like go and find the representative of the sociology department as authorized by the sociology department. It can be use your credibility, even if it's through, you know, shared drop offs at the daycare center or <laughs> the faculty senate to get uh, someone in another part of campus who will be your partner 
Um, don't underestimate that. And then the hard edged one is like, if, if you're finding that you're getting um, pushback or if you've started down a path that will be perceived as excluding the social scientists and humanists, then you can press the reset button and say you want to bring them in and formally give them a role in shaping the curriculum. And if Berkeley can be useful as an example for there, I am happy to call your university leadership and tell them that we did it this way, if that help changes anything. Because um, I, I, I'm not passionate about this. I think this is a moment to set the field on a better course than it might have gone down otherwise if social scientists and humanists who attend to questions of ethics and human context weren't involved and to signal that to students. But this is not just, and it's not just a matter technical field, but this is often data about human beings and understanding human contexts. It has got to be part of their education if it's a um, full-fledged responsible program. Okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox there, but I often get on that soapbox. We have five minutes left are there. I want to make sure we get um, make sure there's no questions that we're not um, overlooking. Um, God, I see multiple ones. Um, so one uh, there's one about implicit bias. how you know how can how can you assess your own implicit bias um, present in your own work? is a really fantastic um, question. Um, God, there's probably a few different ways of approaching this. Margo, if you have a response, please go ahead while I... Well, I think that's actually really connected to what Catherine was just saying, uh, that so much of learning about our own perspectives is in putting them in conversation with uh, people who are looking at the same object um, and concerned and generally like interested in it, but from a very different perspective. So like bringing, you know, making sure that you are in conversation with people from the humanities and social sciences, and who, especially those who are, as Catherine said, perhaps um, already kind of you have some connection with and can be honest about with, and perhaps people who are interested in making that, um, in making the connection across the disciplines and, and finding common languages and because a lot of what we talk about in in what a lot of what we teach about in data science uh, is is how to work in teams in teams with people who have very different roles and different uh, ways of knowing, and so that you know that only through that kind of teamwork can we learn really learn a, about ourselves, who, what we contribute, and what our limitations are, understand our own expertise and our own place in the in the project, and then working towards a successful completion. So I think the same thing applies to us as teachers and developers of curriculum, and therefore even more critical to have diverse, you know, cognitively and in other ways, you know, diverse teams developing and thinking about the broader worlds in which the, the, the technology sit and which they help to create. I would, I would you know, add, add to that. that um, and part of why I, I would kind of reinforce what Margot is saying is, you know, there are sort of check bias checklists out there, and it's certainly, you know, valuable to take a look at them and think about them. But that requires a certain kind of motivation, and there's ways in which both their, you know, your blind spots don't show up through using checklists. But there's also something that's missed simply through checklists, and also by framing it only as an issue of bias. Um, so much of, for example, what comes up around issues of structural racism isn't just that okay, everybody involved in these institutions has certain biases. It's that the norms of a particular workplace, the norms of, a, of an institution or an academic culture sometimes have discriminatory structures built into them. And so it's not necessarily a cognitive bias that an individual has so much as sort of the everyday kind of goings on fulfilling norms and expectations of you set by the environments that you exist in. And so in part becoming aware of those larger structures. Um, who are the people being invited to, to panels? Um, what sorts of um, 
you know, what, what counts as a, as, as good research and how might certain um, discriminatory values be built into sort of what's valued as being like a, a good research paper, for instance, and what's seen as being some as, as not being worthwhile, worth one's time. Um, and those things often don't fully fall under, you know, the rubric of bias and wouldn't be noticed otherwise. And so that's a really, it's a deep training. There's no easy fix. And that's why often, yeah, working and collaborating with people who are sensitive to these things and can point them out and learning how to have those conversations and be, be receptive uh, when, you know, a criticism is pointed out that maybe doesn't conform to an idea of, you know, a, a, you know pre preconceived notion of what, what bias is or should look like. So we have uh, probably less than a minute left in this hour, but I think as you can all see, we're just at the beginning of a lot of interesting and conversations to continue. And one tangible way in which we can continue is to please join us tomorrow in the morning, uh, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Pacific time, uh, for a panel with really incredible people who have been teaching human context and ethics, uh, or uh, you know, ethics uh, questions of ethics and the human in as part of data science education they'll share their insights and that will be another opportunity to to ask questions and and develop our thinking together and we invite you to also get in touch with ari with catherine and myself to uh, if there are things we can provide resources uh, which we have everything we develop at berkeley is we do it you know with an intention to that it can serve others and we're happy to to help uh, collaborate or to share our materials so thank you very much and um, we look forward to being in touch. Thank you very much.